Good morning and welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church in Wheaton. And a special huge thank you to the Wheaton College Gospel Choir under the direction of Tanya Egler, who will be providing so much wonderful gospel music for us today. Please prepare your hearts and minds as we worship our God.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul, uh, Miss Tanya and your choir. In addition to the incredible talent that you have demonstrated, you have brought energy to a traditional Lutheran church that <laughs> has sometimes been referred to as boring at times. Uh, we, we don't even know how to clap. I, I'm sure <laughs> but thank you very much, and we're excited about the rest of the music you're going to be providing for us today. Well, with that, we'll invite our kiddos to come and join us for Children's Church today. We are going to be hearing about uh, a, a certain story of a man named Samuel and King, well, someone who is going to be King David. We're going to hear about this word called anointing and what it means to have some goodness in your heart as well. So, yes, Miss Riley, if you want to grab the cross, you can lead the way today, and we will follow Miss Riley into Children's Church. <laughs> all right, and we'll be back in time for Children's Church. So let's make our way and follow Miss Riley. We'll see you all soon. Or back in time for communion. We're going to Children's Church. <laughs> Come on. Please rise. Scripture is full of questions. Am I my brother's keeper? Who do you say that I am? Who How many times shall I forgive? If God is for us, who can be against us? Scripture is full of questions. So just like those in our scriptures, may we bring our full curiosity and wonder into this space. In today's text, the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? They want to know who around them could be blamed for suffering. The disciples want to identify who around them had done wrong. In the prayer of confession, we stop pointing fingers at others. In confession, we turn our attention toward ourselves and invite God into that honest and vulnerable space. So do this countercultural thing with me today. Let us pray together using the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Who here has sinned? We have sinned. We put our heads in the sand. We ignore people in need. We make false assumptions and fail to be kind. We are in need of forgiveness. Good news. Our God is a merciful God who does not punish, hold grudges, or keep score. When you suffer, God weeps. When you sin, God forgives. When you lose your way, God comes running. Thanks be to God for love like that. Have you sinned? I have sinned. I have sinned. I put my head in the sand. I ignored people in need. I make false assumptions and fail to be kind. I too am in need of forgiveness. Good news. Our God is a merciful God. God does not punish hold grudges or keep score. When you suffer, God weeps. When you sin, God forgives. When you lose your way, God comes running. Thanks be to God for a love like that.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. God of good news, there is, there is reading your word. There is hearing your word. And then there is tunneling ourselves into your word. Harvesting your word. Building a home in your word. Laying your word over us like a blanket. Wrapping ourselves in your word. Know your word like the back of our hand. Singing your word. Planting ourselves like a garden in your word. God, we could listen to scripture like we listen to the news. Or we could cocoon ourselves in your word. And it could change us entirely. So bundle us up. Give us the ladder. We want to know you. With hopeful hearts, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How shall can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely his anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. have you stand for the gospel, but because it's a very long but lovely story today, you may be seated. The Holy Gospel according to John chapter 9. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. 
When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am he. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, I was blind, and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When I first read this gospel passage years ago, I thought it was just a story about a healing, that Jesus heals a man born blind, he's able to give him sight, something he never had before, and now he can live a 
a normal life. Way to go, Jesus. But through the years, I've looked at this story a little bit differently. I've, always, I've often wondered what it would be like to be a person without sight, someone who is actually blind, how they would hear this story. Or basically anyone who was born with a disability or has a disability. Would they hear these words and say, well, that's great for the man who was born blind, Jesus healed him, but what about me? What about my affliction? What about my illness or my disability? Does this mean that I am somehow less than human? That I am not whole and I need Jesus to come and put mud on my eyes to make me be able to see or to heal my leg or to cure my illness? And I think that would be an offensive way of looking at the gospel. You would be offended if that were you, wouldn't you? That's why I think we have to be very careful when we look at the healing miracles of Jesus. Because our Lord was so complex. There was underlining meaning to everything that he said and did. I'm convinced that it's the symbolism behind the miracles that are more important than the miracles themselves. And I I clearly see that in today's story. To just kind of go through what happens here in this passage, Jesus heals this man who is born blind. And when his disciples see that he is born blind, they ask the question, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, no, no, you, you got it all wrong. It's not about sin. You're you're about to see the glory of God revealed right in front of you. And so Jesus gets some mud, spits in it, which seems kind of gross to me, but (laughs) if it was Jesus, I guess I would let Jesus do that to me. Puts the, the mud on his eyes, and all of a sudden, after a little bit, the man can see. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders who are constantly bickering back and forth with with Jesus, constantly questioning him and attacking him. They're not convinced that this is a real miracle. And so what they do is they go back to this man's parents to see if he actually was <laughs> born blind. I mean, how, how bad is that, right? <laughs> this miracle happens right in front of you, and you're doubting it so much that you have to go find his parents to see if he really was born blind. And of course, they say, yes, our son was born blind. And they say, well, how is it that he can see now? And they go, we have no idea how he can see now, but he was born blind, and yes, this is our son. We don't know. He is of age. Why don't you go and ask him yourself? So they go to the man, and they say, is it true that you were born blind? Yes, I was born blind. Is it true that this man healed you, and now you can see? And he said, yes. And then he questioned the Pharisees and said, why do you want to know so badly? Do you also want to be his disciples? And then that was enough for the Pharisees. Oh, no, we're not his disciples. You can be this man's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. Now, as we we look at this story, we kind of bring ourselves back to Jesus' response to all of it. And when I say the symbolism of the healing is more important, it's ironic that Jesus gives physical sight to a man who could not see. But yet, this story and this healing is all about spiritual blindness. The Pharisees were blind to the truth of God. And I think it's an oversimplification to just kind of paint the Pharisees as the bad guys and Jesus as the good guy. What we really need to see, because Jesus encounters the Pharisees over and over again throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospels, I think we need to see the Pharisees in ourselves. Because whether we admit it or not, we are often blind to the truths of God. Even in the church, when we're trying to do the right thing, we're worshiping God, we're trying to to follow Christ, we still are blinded. Yes, there are times when our own feeling of self-importance gets in the way and blinds us, like it did for the Pharisees, or our own our, our, our arrogance, where we just think we're better than everyone else. We religious people tend to lean that way from time to time, and maybe we don't speak it, but we think, yeah, this is my 17th Sunday in a row that I've been to church. Isn't God really happy with me? <laughs> but I think it's a, it's a greater blindness than that. We have been blinded in the church, in the modern church, by society. Society has changed the church. 
and we are called to be apart from the world, right? But yet, somehow, we have been influenced in many negative ways. And one of the biggest ways is the way that we see children. Do you remember the story when um, Jesus was preaching and his disciples were all gathered around him and there was a crowd and the kids came up to Jesus and they wanted to sit on his lap and the disciples scolded them and said, no, 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 not now, children. Jesus is preaching. Do you remember Jesus' response? He said, suffer the children not. <laughs> Let the kids come up to me. Because unless you enter the kingdom of heaven like a child, you will never enter it. Why did Jesus say that? Did Jesus say that so that we would be more pure and innocent like children? I think that's a pretty popular take on, on that story. Is it so that we can be like children? Because the children are the future of the church. And this is the mindset that we have in the modern church today. You look at churches, and if they have lots of kids, you say, that's a successful church. Look at all those Sunday school rooms. You remember years ago here at St. Paul when we, I mean, I don't know how many Sunday school classes were in the fellowship hall, but I think there's like 12 dividers. So there's a possibility that there were 12 separate Sunday school classes in one space. And we have all the other rooms that were for Sunday school. And maybe since the pandemic, you lament the fact that it's not like it was in the old days. Kids don't seem to be coming to church as much as they used to. And so we're hard on ourselves, and we seem to think that children are the key, right? Just like Jesus, who put the child and the children in front of him and said, this is the way you need to enter the kingdom of heaven, we look at, at kids as the most valuable resources that we have. We look at kids, we look at children as resources. Is that the way God wants the church to be? To, to have kids be resources, to be used and exploited, to make ourselves feel good about ourselves? Now, I think the reason why Jesus placed the children in the midst of him and said, this is how you need to enter the kingdom of heaven, because children, by their very nature, are relational. A child cannot come into the world by th themselves. They are completely dependent on others, their parents, their parental figures, their grandparents, the people around them. Whereas adults, we can say, well, you know, I'm an introvert. I make the choice to, to kind of not be around people as much. But it, as children, you can't make that choice. And so by putting the child in the midst of them, Jesus is saying, this is how you need to be. My body is about community. A child is dependent, is vulnerable. You need to be able to take care of each other and allow yourselves to be taken care of by others. You have to not be afraid to be vulnerable, to be cared for, because that's what community is all about. So these children aren't these like prize trophies that we hold up in churches to say, look at all of our kids. These children remind us of what we need to be, that we need to be able to interact with one another. And even when we're mad or upset with one another because someone said something that upset us or offended us, we need to always be about reconciliation and forgiveness because that's what the body of Christ is all about. And just in case you're worried that churches don't have kids anymore, I fully believe that there is not a church that exists in this world that doesn't have children. They may not be there physically present, but every single congregation, regardless of the age of that congregation, has some child that they are praying for, some child that is being lifted up, whether it is a neighbor, a grandchild, uh, so, so, someone from your work or school or something like that, there are children in every congregation. And they're being lifted up because we're reminded to be more like that. But there's something else that's happening here. I mean, even though we sense that we're blinded and we have to be reminded that we're more like the Pharisees than we care to admit, the real part of this healing story is that Jesus brings this man back into community. It's not about the eyesight. It's about the fact that this man 
was put on the fringes of this society. Probably because nobody wanted to, to, well, there was all kinds of reasons. They didn't want to, they felt uncomfortable because this man was blind. They didn't know how to re react to him and relate to him. There wasn't the technology that we have now, so that person would be unbelievably dependent on others, and maybe they didn't want that hassle or headache. But remember the way they looked at illness and physical disabilities back in biblical times. They saw it as some kind of punishment that you were getting from God. And, and you clearly see this with the disciples who are saying, Jesus, who sinned? This man couldn't have sinned. He, he was born blind. So it must have been his parents that sinned. And his blindness is a punishment on them for, their, for all the terrible things that they said and did. So with this mentality, someone who had any kind of disability was cast off from, from the rest of the people. So by healing this man, by giving him sight, he was bringing him back into the fold, into the community. One chapter after this chapter that we have for today, Jesus talks about the Good Shepherd. And we're going to have Good Shepherd Sunday coming up fairly soon. And he says, I have, I have taken care of all those who you've given me, Lord. But there are still some in my fold that I need to go out and get. These were words that this blind man who now could see was meant to hear because he was being brought back into community. It's not so much about whether or not he can see with his eyes. It's about what was going on in his heart and what was going on in the community. Jesus was saying to this man, I am going to heal you so I can give you this abundant life that you've never known before. And you can get it through me. Isn't that the message for all of us? no matter who we are, that Jesus wants to give us this abundant life, a life that we've never known or experienced before, but we can only get it through him. Amen. join together in the affirmation of faith. We believe in a merciful God. A God who does not keep score. A God who wants good for us. We believe in a creative God. A God who will heal the blood. A God capable of seeing what we cannot. We believe in a saving God. A God who heals. A God who greets our prayers. 
questions with patience, a God who sets us out with hope in our step. What wondrous love is this. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Creating God, By your word, you have made all things, and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breadth of your creation, from the grandest mountain range to the smallest springtime bud. Merciful God, powerful God, you anoint kings and established rulers. Guide the work of all heads of state and elected officials. Encourage them to lead with justice and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Merciful God, shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend to all who are sick or require healing and recovery, especially Beth, Paul, Barb, Lois, Edna, Martin, Carolyn, Grace, Paula, Kevin, Lori, Mark, Lavelle, Jill, those mentioned in the Book of Prayers, and all others whom we name aloud or silently. Comfort those who grieve, especially the families of Betty Justy, William Morrissey, Robert King Richards, Kevin Bergman, Yvonne Boone, and Dorothy Bryson. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministries of this congregation and community, especially Our Meals Do Matter, the People's Resource Center, PADS, Northern Illinois Food Bank, and Feed My Starving Children. Nourish us so we can nourish our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of history, with thanksgiving we remember our ancestors in faith who cared for your people, especially Joseph, guardian of Jesus. We praise you for the ways they form the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please surprise me in a few hours.
Let us pray. God of all creation, you gather the whole world around you in love and tenderness. May these gathered treasured gifts of bread and wine, time and talents provide sustenance to us and the whole world in our journeys of seeking and finding as you pour out your very presence for our sake. Through Christ, the source of goodness and life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. For you sent your child to be our teacher and our guide. Through him, you showed us how to love and be loved, how to enact justice and pray for peace, how to seek truth and share in joy. And so with the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, speaking these words, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of the lost and the found. Surely it is right for us to give our thanks and praise. For day after day we look for you, and day after day we find you. In the laughter of children, in the sun rising over the horizon, in the flowers of spring. Our seeking does not go unanswered, and for that we are grateful. So first and foremost, we come to you in prayer to say thank you. For when we are seeking beauty, you give us mountains and freckles, green eyes and brown eyes. When we're seeking for reasons to hope, you give us rainbows after the storm and candles flickering in the window. When we're seeking peace, you give us three-part harmony and the sound of the rain. And when we are seeking justice, your life reminds us that everyone is welcome at your table and none shall be turned away. In that seeking, we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For all these reminders, we are deeply grateful. And yet, gracious God, our seeking does not stop. For even though your fingerprints are all over the world, we are not yet at your promised day. So in addition to our gratitude, we also pray for conviction. Do not let us get comfortable with half-hearted seeking. Do not let us grow numb to the suffering of this world. Make us relentless in our pursuit of justice, relentless in our consoling of the grieving, in our welcoming of the stranger, and in the feeding of the hungry. Like a dog with a scent, may we walk toward your kingdom, never giving up, never wandering off the path. And as we see and as we seek, pour out your spirit on this ordinary bread and cup. May this meal be the nourishment we need to continue seeking you in the world. Until your promised day, we pray. Until your promised day, we will seek. Through Christ, our guide and companion. Amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray in the words most comfortable to each. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As a reminder, as we commune today, we'll commune with the pulpit side first, followed by the piano side. You'll come forward and receive a host. If you need a gluten-free host, let me know. There's a tray of grape, uh, wine and then a tray of grape juice. You can dispose of your cup in the uh, basket on the side of the space as you are returning to your seat. Uh, yeah, and that's all the announcements. But now, the invitation to communion. Friends, if, you're, you're, if your seeking has led you here, 
If your weary heart followed breadcrumbs all the way to this sanctuary, then I have good news. You do not have to seek anymore. This table is God's table. So if you came here looking for justice, then rest in the comfort that all will be fed here. If you came seeking beauty, then let your spirit marvel at the beauty of community coming together. If you came seeking a brush with the divine, then know that God is present in this ordinary meal. So kick off your walking shoes. Let your weary heart stop the search. We are standing on holy ground. This is God's table. All are invited. Thanks be to God.
Now receive God's blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of manna and mustard seeds, we came to this table hungry and we leave feeling full. Full of hope. Full of promise. Full of what could be. For we not only found glimpses of you at this table, but we caught a glimpse of the way things could be in a meal where all are welcomed and all are fed. Is there anything holier than that? So thank you for nourishing our curiosity alongside our spirit and our conviction. May we always seek you the way you seek after us. With grateful hearts we pray. Amen. As we journey on our way this week, may you receive this blessing. As you leave this place, may God bless you with seeking. Seek out the hungry. Seek the weary. Seek the good in every person you pass. Seek out the hopeful. Seek the faithful. Seek God in each of us. As you seek and as you wonder, may you find what you are looking for. In the name of our loving God, who is always seeking us. Amen. We join together in singing our sending hymn.
Before I give you the, the dismissal and benediction, I would just ask that you would remain seated after the dismissal because we have some special music by our gospel, the Wheaton College Gospel, I almost called them our gospel choir, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> our gospel choir up there that sings every week. Um, so they're going to be playing uh, the post loop. Connected to community, neighbor, and faith, go in peace, seek and serve in love. Thanks be to God.